QuickBooks Online 2024 Purchase and Finance Equipment. Get ready and some coffee because we're going on air with QuickBooks Online 2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our crunching numbers is my cardio product line. Now, I'm not saying that subscribing to this channel, crunching numbers with us, will make you thin, fit, and healthy or anything. However, it does seem like it worked for her. Just saying. So, you know, subscribe, hit the bell thing, and buy some merchandise. So you can make the world a better place by sharing your accounting instruction exercise routine. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our Get Great Guitars 2024 QuickBooks Online sample company file we set up in a prior presentation, opening up the major financial statement reports like we do every time. The reports, they're on the left. We're in the favorites. We're going to be right-clicking on that balance sheet to open a link in a new tab. Right-clicking the profit and loss to open a link in a new tab. Doing the same with the trusty TB trial balance. Let's go to the tab to the right. Close up the hamburger. Change that range for the first couple months of 2024. Oh, 10124 tab. 022824. I want to see a month-by-month, -month, side by side. So we'll drop it down months and run it. Then let's tab to the right, repeat the process. Hand boogie needs to be closed. 010124 tab, 022824 tab. Let's select the months so we can then run to refresh. And one more time, tabbing to the right, hand boogie closed, changing the range in 010124 tab, 022824 tab. Months on the drop down, and then we will refresh the report. Let's go to the balance sheet to discuss the new process happening this time. We have decided to purchase more equipment at this point in time. So you will recall that equipment is something that we purchased at the beginning of the process when we started up the new business. So when we start a new business, typically what we will need is cash. We have to have cash in order to purchase the furniture, equipment, building, property, planting, equipment, and the inventory. Now, before we start the business, of course, how are we going to get that cash? Well, we're going to get that cash from either a third party, the bank. We took out a loan in order to get the cash right here, or we can finance it ourselves, putting our own money into the business so we can pay for those startup costs. And then to start our shop of selling guitars, we took that money and we purchased the fixed assets of the, uh, the furniture and whatnot in the store and whatever. And then we also had to purchase the actual uh, inventory so that we can sell uh, the inventory. But again, the neighborhood has gone down downhill and people put gum on the bottom of our couches and like, and then, you know, they put like they, I guess, tagged on it, whatever that is. Like they put these names, I can't even read it. I don't even know what it's supposed to say, but apparently it's important information that had to be put on our couch. So, <laughs> so we're going to buy, so what we've decided to buy new equipment now uh, to refresh this, uh, to refresh our stuff. So, but you will recall that that usually only happens when we buy property, plants, and equipment at the startup of the business, or possibly when we're when we're upgrading the business. We're not typically needing to buy a lot of fixed assets, large purchases all the time. So, unlike with supplies, unlike with our normal expenses, we don't expect this to be a cyclical kind of thing that happens all the time, but rather something that happens periodically. And so, and also note that the second time around, we might then have the money already because now we can accumulate money from sales because we already had the furniture and equipment from the startup costs uh, in order to generate sales. And hopefully we can build up some money to expand, to grow uh, the shop. That would be the idea. 
Now, when we first purchased the equipment, we first took out the loan, got the money, and then used the money to pay for the equipment, meaning we paid for the equipment basically with cash. However, we can imagine a situation where we're going to say, hey, look, I'm not going to take out the money first, but rather finance the equipment, possibly from the same people that I'm I'm getting the equipment from. So in other words, I'm going to finance the equipment that I'm purchasing at the point in time that I'm purchasing it. So there's no actual cash involved in this transaction. We're getting equipment and we're taking out a loan. What's going to happen then? The equipment account is going to go up and the other side is going to go to a uh, loan payable type of account. Okay, so a couple things just with the furniture and equipment themselves. Uh, if we go into the furniture and equipment, we can see there's not a whole lot of transactions happening. Nothing happened for the current month of furniture and equipment. And in the prior month, we would have uh, that couple transactions when we started the business in the furniture and equipment. So that's important to note because we're going to need a sub ledger for the furniture and equipment, noting that we don't actually just expense the equipment when we purchase it. We're going to put it on the books as an asset. And you're kind of required to do that. This is an accrual thing to do. It's not a cash-based thing to do. But if you're in the United States, you can't get around it. You can't just basically say, I'm just going to be in a cash-based system for the most part, because at least for taxes, even if you're a small business, you're going to have to follow the tax code, which will force you to put it on the books as an asset, although it might allow you to use 179 or special depreciation to deduct it anyways. But the general idea is you have to put it on the books as an asset. You can see the reason for that most clearly with very large purchases, such as those for buildings. If you purchase a building and you simply expensed it in the month that you purchased it, you're gonna have a huge loss because you didn't really purchase the building to use it in that month, but rather you purchased it to use it for years into the future. So you can see how it will distort the comparison of the income statement. That's the point of the accrual process. It's better for comparison period to period based on performance, not cash flow. And then we have another statement, statement of cash flows, to help us to see the cash flow information as well as the accrual information. Although the accrual information, the accrual process, as you can see, is more uh, cumbersome. It's more difficult because now I have to put it on the books as an asset and then depreciate it. So if I put it on the books as an asset, then I also need to notice if you put it on, it's kind of like inventory in that if we're going to actually invest in the equipment, we also want to keep track of it. Now, it's less likely that someone's going to walk out the door with our couch as they will with a guitar or something like that, like the inventory, although they, they might defile the couch in some way, shape or form, you know, apparently, but but uh, it's unlikely that they're just going to steal the couch, less likely. However, we want to be able to track uh, the couch for the, for the same reason. We want to have a subledger for the assets that are on the books. But that subledger, which will list out our equipment, is not often done in QuickBooks in the United States because we already have to do a, a subledger in the tax software. So oftentimes you'll have the tax software that's going to help you out with the subledger, which might look something like this, listing out for furniture and equipment the actual things that have been that you have under furniture and equipment. And then the tax software can help us also to do the depreciation adjustment, meaning the expensing of the cost of equipment over the useful life of the business, which we'll talk more about in a future course or section when we get to the adjusting entry process. When we're purchasing the equipment, however, what we really want to understand is I need to get the detail of the information of what we're purchasing. If there's a if there's a product number for it, if I bought multiple things, I want to list out those multiple things separately on the on the depreciation schedule, which means I have to provide my accountant with a list of exactly what we purchased so that when I sell it, I will be able to identify the thing that we sold. If I say, hey, look, this this couch uh, is is desecrated and I <laughs> I've got too too many I don't know who who above Homa has is that oh, I can't read this thing but apparently that's a person that needed to put their some kind of name on my couch 
And so I need to throw it away now. So I'm going to throw my couch. But if I have multiple couches and I can't identify which one it is, that's going to be difficult because I have to reduce not only the couch, but also the depreciation related to it when I dispose of or sell a piece of property. So that's going to be important to put it on the books. But right now we want to be thinking about another issue, which is that if there's no cash affected, what form am I going to use in order to put this on the books? Remembering that if I hit the drop down, usually the journal entry is the last thing that we use because QuickBooks has broken out the forms by cycle so that the forms give us a nice audit trail and make it easy for the bookkeeper as well as an auditor to track what has actually happened. So any normal transaction, any cyclical transaction, those that happen repeatedly will typically have a form related to it. But purchasing equipment is not something that happens all the time. So you might think it would be in the vendor section. However, if cash is not affected, where it is not in this case, we're not, it's not going to come through the bank feeds or anything, then we're not going to have any cash affected. So what form are we going to use? Due to the fact that there isn't one, remember the, the list of process we go through, one, is there a form related to it? If not, then is cash affected? If cash is affected, I'll use an expense or check form possibly. And if not, then I default to a journal entry. So this is where we basically have to do a journal entry. However, we can still use the register. So we can use a journal entry in the register so that that might make it a little bit easier. So we're going to say that we finance this thing. Let's go to the first tab and go down to the, uh, the uh, transactions. And I'm going to close up the hand boogie, go into the chart of accounts. And we're going to say that we're going to finance this thing. And I'm just going to imagine the loans coming from Bank of America. So I want to make up another loan account. Now the loans are another kind of issue. You, you'll recall here that we had the loans payable. Uh, that was the current portion of the loans payable. But now we have multiple loans. So if I go into the balance sheet over here, uh, do I, I could just keep this one loan payable account. Where is it? Where did it go? There it is. I could just keep this one account and put multiple loans within it. But that's going to be a little bit more difficult from for internal bookkeeping purposes. What I would like to do is break out uh, the loans into into a parent account, possibly, and then multiple subsidiary accounts so I can track the loan balance each one at a time. This being quite common if you deal with types of businesses that have a lot of fixed assets, such as construction companies, farms and things like that, because they're often financing different pieces of equipment, the equipment then acting as collateral support of the loan balance for the bank to allow them to process the loan for them. So let's go over here and say that we're going to, we're going to say we have a new one. And it's going to be a loan. So I'm going to say it's a liability, I'm going to put it into current liability. So I'm going to say it's a current liability. Let's scroll on down to do, 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 do. I'll say other current, yeah, other current liability and line of credit loan payable, let's say, and then I'm just going to call it B of a loan. And then I'm going to imagine that I put the last four digits of the loan number because that will help me internally to know which loan it is because I might have multiple loans that are coming from the same institution. If we trust the institution, we will probably do repeat business uh, with that institution and therefore the institution in and of itself might not be enough of an indication of identifying each of the loans. So that's going to be our loan payable. So let's save that. Okay, now let's see if we can figure a way to make it a subsidiary type of account. So I've got my loan, I've got my Bank of, of America account here. And then I also have, uh, this is the other current liability. And then I've got my general loan payable account, which is down here. And that's that's the loan payable current portion. So what I'd like to do is basically make a parent account, which is just going to be generally loan payable current portion, and then put these two within it. So what I'm going to do is change this name to make it less generic. I'm going to select the drop down. I'm going to edit this one. And I'm going to imagine this one came from Chase. 
So instead of just calling it loan payable, I'm going to call it Chase, let's say Chase, uh, Chase loan, and then we'll put the loan number we're imagining again of whatever, duh, 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 last four digits of the loan number. So now I've identified the two individual loans by institution and by the last digits of the loan number. Now I'm going to make a parent account to house those two under as subsidiary accounts. So now I'm going to make a new account and this is going to be a do, 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 liability. This is going to be an other current liability. It's going to be once again, a loan payable. I'll call it loan payable current portion, which might be redundant. You might not need current portion because it's in the current portion of the loan payable, but you might make another loan payable long-term portion which means you'll have two names that are the same and that'll cause you kind of a problem. QuickBooks won't let you possibly record it maybe. So in any case, we'll keep it at that and we'll save it. So now we have that in there and now I need to go back in the two that we made and make them subordinate or sub subsidiary to my new parent account. So this loan payable for the B of A, selecting the dropdown, editing it, and I'm gonna say D -d -d -d, in the loan payable, that's correct. But then down here, I want to make it, I want to make it, let's actually here. <laughs> I'm looking for, I'm looking for the loan payable current portion. There it is. So now I can see down here, it gives you a little display of it. Now it's going to be subordinate subsidiary to the loan payable current portion. I'm going to do the same for my other chase loan. Let's do that. And then I'm going to say, all right, there's the loan payable. Boom. And then the chase loan don day for crying out loud a star uh the chase loan there it is and then we're gonna hit the drop down edit that one and i'm gonna say that this one is going to be subordinate also that's not the right one here to this one so loan payable current portion boom okay so now we have a parent that will not have anything uh, in it, and then the two accounts below it will have a drop down. Let's see what that looks like now on the balance sheet. It's only going to have one of the two because we don't have the two balances in there. But if I scroll down, there it is. Nothing's in the parent loan payable current portion. And then we have the one loan that's currently on the books. Now we're going to record the second loan on the books. We can use a register format to do that instead of a journal entry. So we're used to the registers most likely in the checking account, but we have a register format for every balance sheet account except for the retained earnings or the owner's equity in our case. So we could use either one because both of them are balance sheet accounts, either the equipment account or the loan payable account. Let's go to our loan payable account because we just set that one up. Let's go into it. If I say, okay, uh, there I said, okay, okay, I said it. Okay, I said I'd say okay. If I say okay, we're going to go into the view register here. Now, this is the loan payable. The loan payable should be going up with a credit. So it's a little tricky because it's going up with a credit. But we're going to say that we purchased this on, on 022824. And let's say uh, we purchase it from, well, just imagine it was Bank of America, even though they're the ones that finance it. Bank, what did I call it? B of A. I think bank, let's just say, uh, and we're going to say, okay, that's going to be a vendor. And I'm going to say save in this case, even though it's really the financial institution, but I'm going to, and then in the memo, you might want to put exactly what you purchased. So equip, equipment, dot, dot, dot. And you might want to put a lot more detail of the, you know, equipment that was purchased because this is where you're going to, you're going to want the transaction to show so that when you go to your tax return preparer, they don't put it on there as just generic equipment was purchased because that will make it difficult when you sell the equipment. So 5,000 increase on the loan. And then the other side is going to go into the equipment account. So I'm looking over here for fixed asset types. So do, do, do we have expenses they kind of put it in a funny order they're trying to help you out but it's actually a little confusing to me i kind of wish they would just put it in normal order but whatever it's in the furniture and equipment 
So there it goes. What's, the, what's this going to do? It's going to increase the loan, hopefully in a credit direction. Uh, and then the other side is going to go to equipment, which should increase equipment. So it should, in other words, debit equipment and credit the loan. Let's see if that's what it does. If it goes the right way, I can then go back into it, edit it. And we can see the loan got credited and the furniture and equipment got debited. And it did use a journal entry, even though I entered it into a register format. I'm going to copy the description to both sides, save and close it. So that looks good. Let's go into our balance sheet and check it out so I can run the report again. And then I can go into my furniture and equipment. Boom is now at 103. Can't you see? Oh my goodness. Okay, we're going to go into, there it is. It's a journal entry form. And so there we have our journal entry form. Now notice you can't as easily tag something to this form like if you needed to show a receipt or something like that. So, so again, you, you want to be make sure that you have the added detail, the receipts that you can provide possibly, you know, storing it or saving it as a PDF or something so that when you provide this information to the client or to your tax preparer, you give them this transaction entry so they know the amount that was purchased, but they also have all the detail that they need to break that out into whatever format is necessary to properly put it on the depreciation schedule, properly calculating depreciation in this period, but also allowing you to be able to handle the accounting when you sell or dispose of the equipment because you can identify which equipment is being sold, both the physical equipment as well as on the, the ledger, the sub ledger. Okay, so let's go back on over. Then the other side is gonna go into this new loan payable account. So now we got the loan payable, dropping it down. And so see how nice that is now, because now I can, I can ex show this externally to one account that just has both of them in it, because that's all most external users, users need. But internally, I can drop it down and I can see the loan balances for each of these. So when I make the payments, I can still tie it out and make sure that this ties out to the amortization tables. Note, however, that we also might have to break out a short-term and long-term portion of the loan. However, I wouldn't do that every transaction because that'll be too tedious because that will change every time. Instead, having a long-term portion of the loan in a similar fashion, loan payable long-term portion, uh, and then the two loans within it, breaking out the current and long-term portion with adjusting entries at the end of the month or year as is required and possibly having the help of, a, of the CPA firm or, or accountant to do that. Noting that if you're a small business and you're just doing a Schedule C, you might not need to break out the short-term and long-term portion for external purposes, although it might be useful for internal purposes for your own decision-making because it's not affecting the income statement, which is the main statement used for tax preparation for a Schedule C sole proprietor type of business. So in any case, we'll talk more about that when we get to the adjusting entries in a future uh, course or section. All right, so let's see, this is where we stand. We're gonna keep it there for now. This is the balance sheet and looks MUI B to the N. I got two letters for it, B N, MUI B N, okay. And then we go to the income statement, nothing happened to the income statement because we put it on the books as an asset. And remember, just note, we it's not because, you might think it'd be logical to think, well, it didn't affect the income statement because we didn't pay for it yet. We took out a loan, but that's not right. That's not the reason it's not on the income statement. It, it's not on the income statement because we had to put it on the books as an asset, even if we paid cash as we did in the first month of operation when we bought the original equipment, our original sofa, Right, We still didn't expense it at the point of purchase, but rather put it on the books as an asset, even though we paid cash because we have to do that for, for long-term assets. We will expense it, however, in the future in the form of depreciation, which we will see in a future course or section as uh, we get into the adjusting entries. Okay, let's go to the trial balance. 
Let's run that again. This is where we stand at this point in time. If your numbers match out to these numbers and you're following along, that's great. If not, try changing the date. See if it's a date range issue. The first section is, of course, the assets section, what the company has reported in dollar amounts, not in units, not in number of couches that we have, but in dollars. So we've got the assets, the checking account, accounts receivable, inventory, investment, payments to deposit, prepaid insurance, accumulated depreciation, contra asset account, which is tied to or linked with the furniture and equipment, which we'll have to adjust at the end of the period. And in this case, then we have, that's what the company has, the flip side of the coin, who has claimed to it, the liability and equity, that's who has claimed to it, liabilities first, accounts payable, visa, the bank, the government, the state with the sales tax, the loan payable, the bank, the bank. We have two loans that are out at this point in time. We've got the government again with payroll liabilities that we owe to them, unearned revenue. If we had sales or that we earned, we got cash, but we haven't yet done the work yet. And then we have our claim to the assets in the equity section, including owner's investments, similar to common stock if it was a corporation, and owner's equity, similar to retained earnings if it was a corporation, and then the income statement. Income being credits, expenses being debits, credits minus debits should result in a credit balance if we have income rather than a loss. The whole income statement will roll into, close out on, or into, the owner's equity, otherwise known as retained earnings, if it were a corporation, QuickBooks does that on a yearly basis. So we can then see how that is done by going one year up, 010125 to 010125 and run it to refresh it. And you can see that it squished the income statement into one number, the income statement kind of like an odometer, but one that you reset every year so that on the new trip, all the accounts in it count upwards starting from zero, the owner's equity representing the odometer over the life of the company, all the income that has been generated through the life of the company, which has not yet been distributed out to the owners in the form of draws if it was a corporation, uh, I'm sorry, if it's an individual sole proprietor and dividends if it was a corporation, the equity remembering being the bottom line of the financial statements, if you think of the financial statements in the form of the accounting equation of assets minus liabilities equals equity.